So today I'm, I'm doing a, sort of an overview of what uh, hoarding is. And a lot of us think that we know what it's about from watching shows on TV or uh, hearing about it in conversation, but I think it's important to establish uh, what hoarding is uh, before we continue our discussion today with uh, Lee and Becca Schuer. So uh, I always like to start with myths and truths, right? There's a lot of things out in the world uh, that are myths, and indeed you'll see a few of them up here. Uh, one is that uh, hoarded homes are filthy and that people who live in them are dirty. Is that oh. a myth or a truth? That's a myth. A myth. Yes. People who hoard are lazy and choose to live the way they do. Myth. myth. Yes. Uh, living through an experience like the Great Depression causes hoarding. Myth. So could be, could be. A lot of people are on the fence about that, but in fact, uh, the research shows that that is not true. Uh, that is not true. Hoarding is unique to the United States and is the consequence of an American materialism. No. It's a myth no. as well, yes. And a mass clean-out involving garbage bags, shovels, and dumpsters is the best way to resolve a hoarding problem. Yeah, no. Oh, yeah. no. Okay, yes. Epic mess. Good. Well, you all know what this is about. I can just get off the stage now. <laughs> so uh, what is hoarding? We, we talk about it um, in the context of really three things. Um, and we ask some questions when we're trying to establish if there is a hoarding problem present. Uh, so we ask, is there a, a lot of possessions and is, are people acquiring and failing to discard of those possessions? Uh, does the clutter in that space make it difficult for someone to use their space for the intended purpose? And is there distress um, or impairment for the person uh, in functioning that is caused by the clutter? So these are the questions that we start with. But then we go a little further. Uh, you may have heard of the DSM-5, which is uh, what's used to diagnose hoarding disorder. And there are different criteria for hoarding uh, that are outlined there. And what's interesting about hoarding disorder is it became uh, named such in 2013. Uh, before that, it was thought to be uh, related to obsessive compulsive disorder. However, uh, the research that continued uh, indicates that that's no longer true. So when you came in, uh, there's an information sheet amongst a, a bunch of other information, but that sheet gives um, some Q&A about hoarding, as well as some helping resources for clutter reduction. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that. And if you want to learn a little more about hoarding disorder, you can look there. I could go on for hours, but I don't have hours, so I'll be quick. <laughs> Oh, an important point to make also is about squalor versus hoarding. And there's an assumption that uh, many hoarding cases involve squalor. And in fact, um, squalor is, is extreme uh, filthiness or degradation from neglect. That could be in the presence of the space the person lives or the person themselves. Uh, and the prevalence of squalor with hoarding is quite low. It's about 2% of cases. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, and there is uh, some additional information on that sheet I mentioned that you can read about uh, to get more details. So uh, we ask who, who hoards? Uh, it's interesting that saving begins in childhood. Around age 13, we start to see some indication uh, that people are starting to uh, collect and hoard items. Uh, but we don't have a treatment protocol yet for young people and we're, we're getting there with the research, but it's an interesting part of the field we wanna look at. Uh, folks tend to be, uh, the average age of 50 years old, they tend to be single when they seek help for the problem. Education varies wi widely. Uh, a family history of hoarding is common, so people often ask me, is there a genetic link? And we think there might be. Uh, and again, the smaller conditions are uncommon amongst treatment seekers, and that may be because of the stigma uh, that people may feel, and we'll talk a little more about stigma today. So the prevalence numbers, two to 5% in the US, uh, 15 million people we estimate in the United States has a problem with hoarding. And uh, in other developed countries, very similar numbers. Uh, and just for context, I outlined a few numbers uh, for other diseases, 5.5 uh, million with Alzheimer's, 1.2 million with HIV, 787,000 due to heart disease. So you see that uh, this problem really eclipses other problems that we often hear about. So it's quite prevalent around our country. So uh, there are a number of co-occurring disorders that happen. Oh, um, percentages, thank you. There you go. <laughs> so you see uh, at the top of the list, major depressive disorder is common in about half the people who are challenged with hoarding. 
uh, and on down the list. You can see there are quite a number of other mental health disorders that happen uh, with hoarding, that come with hoarding. As a result or causation or just in their own? Just a link, just a link, yeah. Uh, and I think the most important takeaway from my part today is that hoarding is a behavior, it is not the person. And we feel quite strongly about that as a uh, group, as we work together to educate people and to remind folks uh, about stigma around this problem and that uh, we really need to look at this as a behavior and not define people as hoarders. That's very important. Uh, indicators of a possible problem. These are different things that we look for. Uh, obviously difficulty throwing things away, spaces uh, in the home or personal spaces filled with clutter, difficulty around sorting and organizing and making decisions. These are all the hallmarks of the issue and something that we see quite often when we help folks who have, have this issue. There are a number of things that contribute to a hoarding problem. Um, certainly the genetic, like I mentioned. Uh, there is some neurobiology research that shows that different areas of the brain are stimulated when people are acquiring things or making decisions about saving things that differ from people who do not experience a hoarding problem. So there are some differences. Differences in how we feel about things, our life experiences, what we think about our items, these are all contributors to what can manifest as a hoarding problem. And uh, the signs of hoarding, uh, there are three. So the clutter that we see, the things we see in the space, uh, the reasons for saving, why people save, either they feel a sentimental connection to things or they feel that <coughs> the item has a use, therefore they'll <coughs> save it. Um, Acquiring uh, is also one of the contributors. So uh, I acquire things because they're free. I like to shop. Ooh. Klep kleptomania Ooh. is one of the Ooh. one of the fewer things that not happens. Me. Not, me. not you. <laughs> um, but, but I like to show this picture because these are the things we see above the waterline. If you think of the issue as a as a uh, iceberg, and what you don't necessarily see are all the things we just talked about that contribute to hoarding disorder. So it's important to consider that there's things going on below the waterline that we don't necessarily see, but we need to consider when we think about this issue. That is my piece, uh, but I'd like to uh, refer you to the South Shore Clutter Reduction Collaborative website, and there you'll find information, more information about hoarding disorder. This is Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Making our little transition. If you watched me setting up, you can imagine that the step counter on my watch registers about 34 miles, so <laughs> I've gotten all the exercise I need for a while. And um, I'm, I'm glad I'm here. I'm really glad um, that we were invited back to uh, the South Shore. We've been working with the folks here for quite a while to do education and stigma busting. Um, what we're gonna share today is from the point of view of someone who has experienced excessive finding and keeping and someone who lived with me. So my wife. Yeah. So that essentially is the, the scope of our, our talk. So thank you for sort of sharing some of the diagnostic background. Uh, now we're going to get a little personal. Uh, we are going to cover a lot of information. We are going to have an extended question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question, if you're worried that you're going to forget what it is, write it down. That's what I try to do. But we will definitely come back to it. and. Um, Enjoy. So it begins. So what you're looking at is basically the very first item that I ever acquired. And how old was I when I acquired it? About four years old. Oh, I see a picture now. Right, right. So. Now, you can't say that that little dude up there has hoarding disorder, just a keen interest in things, right? Yeah, yeah. And I came up with this sort of like, I don't know, tagline, do you have anything old you don't need? And so a neighbor gave me that push mower when uh, I asked him if he had anything. Now, I carted that push mower around for a long, long time, from apartment to apartment. The only grass it cut was from the back of my pickup truck to the backyard to lean on a fence and back to the truck to go to the next home. Foreshadowing. So as a little kid, I definitely enjoyed toys. And I want to tell you that the very first nightmare I ever had was about my things. 
Now, over here on the right, you might see some hair rollers, right? Now, I used to play with them. That was, that was fun. And I had this nightmare that I was sitting in my bed, and there were five wicked witches sitting on the floor of my bedroom playing with those curlers, and they would not share them. That was my nightmare. So I think about this connection to stuff and that maybe there's something, there's something there. Well, you mentioned that sort of 13 years old, that early um, teenage years when you start to see the collecting. Um, and again, very, very socially normal. Uh, me and my friends, we were all collecting. So had our baseball cards and our coins and our Star Wars characters and shells and comic books and A-team cards and Pinewood Derby vehicles. Anybody have any of these kinds of things? Everybody. Everybody? Yeah, a lot of us, right? Well, that's how it was. And the, the value was basically based on the quality of the items. How sharp were the corners of the baseball cards, right? How fast was your Pinewood Derby car? Had you read the comic book or not? It's worth more if you hadn't, right? No creases, more value. Seems basic enough. Well, Around, I would say, age 16 or so, a lot of the friends I had found new interests and sort of veered off. And I found myself still enjoying these things. They, they started to take on kind of a new meaning to me. And when I was heading off to college back in 93, I took some of these things and I boxed them up into like time capsules. And I waited about 20 years before I opened the first one. And when I opened it up, I didn't see comic books. I didn't see baseball cards. What I saw was evidence of the first time I self-medicated. That for the first time, the things I owned weren't valuable because they were high value in a price guide, but because they gave me comfort. Calvin and Hobbes was my antidepressant, right? <laughs> this is where I found comfort. So to open that box and look at what I had saved when I was 18, thinking that maybe as an adult I would want it again, was a, a heavy feeling, but a meaningful feeling. So I finished school. I've got a two-year degree in forestry. And off to Alaska I go. And I worked for the state parks for a few different seasons. And then it's hard to get uh, steady work up there. So I turned around and I came back to Massachusetts and I went to UMass and got an English degree. So at this point, I've studied forestry, I've studied English. What do you do with that? Like write poems in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> Only a few people have been paid for that. <laughs> I probably wasn't going to be one of them. So it looked like I was going to need to figure out who I was and what I was going to do. So here I was at this juncture in my life. It was about 2000. And I really had to ask this question, who am I? And I had just moved into an apartment in Northampton. Uh, first time I had been in one place and planning to settle down. Now, I had a couple of roommates. Um, and so I had people around. But I still was pretty socially awkward. Now. I found that if I had interesting things, people wanted to be with me through my things. Sure. Here's a very early picture of um, our friend Sue. Um, this was one of my roommate's girlfriends. And so we're hanging out in what would be called the museum room eventually, and then would be called, to me, an embarrassment. Um, right here. You've got the very first boxes that don't have a place to go. I came across this picture, and I was like, wow, there it is. That's right there. That's the first evidence that things aren't going away as fast as they're coming in. But I got a, a happy friend, right? So it's working. So I start collecting. People find Atari interesting. I do. I'll get more Atari. People find little tchotchkes interesting, Simpsons and things like that. I'll get some of those. People find art to be interesting. I upcycled a salon chair and put speakers in the helmet so that when you put it down, you heard music. 
Eventually, I acquired four of those and completed two of those projects. So I was uh, uh, doing a lot of art, and I was saving every flyer that I made, every drawing that I made, and, and all the cool ones that I saw on telephone poles, pull them down, take them home, add them to the collection. Noticing a trend. So not only that, but I've also got the little ribbons that I won when I was in uh, day camp. I've got tons and tons of pill bottles that I had never discarded because I was concerned about privacy and taking all those labels off was a hassle. So I've got business cards to stores that I used to go to, but don't anymore. I've got a, a paper from 1981. I probably kept it because it said good Lee at the top. My name is Lee. I am six years old. I am in the first grade. Broadmeadow is my school. So I've got all the artwork I was doing in school. But then I've got all the artwork I was doing as an adult. And these are photocopies of the original. These aren't even just the original. And then as I'm digging, I actually find unopened junk mail. Digging and digging and digging. I'm starting to find things that are of concern. Why do I have that? Why didn't I let it go? What was going on that day? Well, with all these collections, I kind of fancied myself a bowerbird. Now, if you know what a bowerbird is, they have a mating ritual where they decorate, over-decorate their little nest, their bower. And that's how they attract a mate, right? So I thought, well, I got a good social life because I got good things. I'm going to get more and more and more. And then maybe I'll find love. Well, <laughs> I did. But well, my love found this. Um, but she didn't know that yet. Essentially, I had way, 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 way too much stuff. Some of it I really liked. Some of it I just couldn't deal with. But I couldn't stop bringing it in. And I couldn't bring myself to let it go. So Beck and I had been married a year. Um, after moving out of our old apartment and recognizing that I had brought all of that stuff with me, um, she said, you know, you, you got to accept some help. This is not a life that I can live with you. This isn't, this isn't me. This isn't us. This could be better. And she came across a number in our company newsletter saying there was a study going on. If you got too much stuff, I qualified. And I was walked through my first intervention of challenging my belief about an attachment to a sentimental shirt. And they said, how are you feeling about that? And I said, terrible. They said, how do you think you're going to feel? I said, worse. We're going to come back in a week. What do you think your distress level will be, 1 to 10? 11. Worse than the worst. Well, they left with that shirt. And I found that, at first, I was definitely definitely upset. I mean, it was really hurting. But then a couple days later, it started to come down like an eight, right? And then a few days later, kind of like a six. And then it kind of went back up, but then it started to come down. And by the time they came back a week later, I had totally, totally challenged and reversed my belief about the attachment to this item. I realized that in the spirit of working to save my relationship, I could let something go in order to save something even more special, right? First time. That was in 2005. So why was it so difficult to reach out for help? Now, you heard about the hoarders shows this morning. How many of you have essentially received your education on the subject from what you've seen on TV? Is that the first place you'd seen it? See a few hands. How many of you? had seen it around in your community before that? Several hands. OK. So this is something that impacts a lot of people. But the perception that's been perpetrated and is that people with this are lazy, that they are greedy and selfish and out of touch with reality. And so why am I going to come forward and say, I need help with this, if people are going to think that about me? I don't want to think that about me. So what you have on TV is shows like Hoarders, advertises compelling, fascinating, mesmerizing, yay, watching someone's mental health challenges, prime time viewing. 
making somebody a lot of money and making somebody else very upset. What do you think might be a couple of the problems with a show like Hoarders and how it impacts recovery? What do you think? Yeah? Um, I think it's because they're like it, um, exposing their personal, like their personal stuff and for, for entertainment value. OK, so exposing people's personal stuff for entertainment value. How can you say that and feel OK about it, right? What else? What else is problematic? How else might that stigma interfere with someone accepting help? Yes? Sorry? They, don't, they don't really help the person because they're addressing the symptom by taking the stuff away. They don't address the cause. Mm -hmm. so right. So they're not helping the person necessarily. They're, they're trying to put a Band-Aid on the problem. Right? They're like, get all the stuff out. Now, let's say I have a problem with alcohol. And out of the goodness of your heart, you come over when I'm not home and you clear out my liquor cabinet. Oh. Oh. Problem's do done because everything's gone. For a lot of people like myself, you're going to go out and do it twice as much the next day because you're upset, you're angry, you're frustrated, and you need to self-soothe. 90% of people who have that forced clean out go back and actually fill it up even more often and a lot faster. Yep. I was going to say two words come to mind, mockery and shame. Mockery and shame. It's a deep shame. And the, I watched one TV show ages ago, and I said I was done with it because it, it makes it this lady said entertainment out of something that is deeply shameful to the individual. Right, so there's, there's a lot of shame here, right? But it's imposed in a way. Like, shame takes two, right? I might feel it, but it's only because I'm worried about how somebody else is going to judge me, right? Now, the idea that people are shamed and that people are portrayed in a negative light, it's not just the person doing the collecting, it's also the people doing the intervention, right? The therapists, the organizers, all of these people involved look really pushy, really edgy, really aggravated. And so, again, if I want help, why am I going to ask for that? So we've done a lot of work to develop alternatives to that kind of an intervention, something that's kinder, gentler, and more sustainable. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But when that's all you're seeing is people making fun of you and the people that you would get help from pushing you and bullying, you're not very likely to reach out for help. But still, I mean, never mind that this was making you look like entertainment. It wasn't done without the consent of a person. Correct. So there was consent given. I'll tell you how they get that consent. So what's often promised is like a year of therapy, that people are going to receive a year of therapy, that, hey, we're going to pay for this you know, clean out, and that costs ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 to do that, sometimes more. Um, and you'll get free therapy, and we'll, we'll pay, and all that. Well, that therapy, in talking with a lot of people, never came. So they had the show, but then they didn't follow up with the promise. Did people die? Have people died as a result of that? People have had major physical disruptions due to the stress of having their things removed. Um, I know a gentleman who did have a heart attack during that process. That's why we're so motivated to avoid having that happen. You know, It's more than heartbreaking. So despite all those negative attitudes, despite all that was being portrayed in the media, despite all the ways I might think people would judge me, I still spoke up. And the first time I spoke up about this outside of our home was at a hoarding task force meeting. So I joined the Western Mass Hoarding Task Force in 2007. And I was a peer specialist sharing about bipolar disorder as a mental health counselor, using that lived experience to support others I still felt more stigma about the clutter than that. And I sat there for a year on this team, silent. I really felt like I didn't have anything to share. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm going to say something. These people are good. I trust them. They respect me. I'm going to say something. So I did. And I said, I might know something about clutter. I was afraid 
that they would look at me differently, that they would talk differently in front of me. But what I came to realize, that I was one of up to 15 million people in this country with the best credential to provide peer support. I was going through it myself, right? So a year after self-disclosing in that meeting, our task force received a grant from Smith College. And what they wanted to do is fund a pilot study to see if peer support groups could be helpful for people who have too much stuff. I raised my hand and I said, I will run all of them. <laughs> I need the help too, man. You know, so I'm going to run all of them. Um, I've never sat down in a, in a group with other people who know what it's like. Um, this is a great opportunity, not just to help other people, but myself at the same time. So what we're looking up at here, this column on the left, this is the outcome after folks went through the very first Buried in Treasures workshops. So the Buried in Treasures book was written by Randy Frost, Gail Steckety, and Dr. David Tolan. And Randy is on the, the hoarding task force, and we worked together to put this program uh, into place. And the first outcome showed an overall 24% improvement. So that's including the ability to resist acquisition, the ability to let things go, and overall sense of quality of life, 24% better. So at the same time, sort of the gold standard for interventions was cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, getting about the same outcomes. Now over here, you see the results of a study that took three years. 300 people went through a support group for clutter. Half of them went to a peer support group, Buried in Treasures. Half of them went to a group run by therapists. After all of those people went through, the results of the folks in Buried in Treasures, 28% improvement. In the therapist-led group, 26%. Peer power, right? So we're starting to see that people with lived experience can help other people, you know? So it's not that therapists don't or can't, but look at the huge resource that's in the community that's been overlooked all this time. You can run a group for the cost of a, a book for everybody in it, right? 15 bucks a person. How much does it cost to see a therapist? More, right? So at this point, the Buried in Treasures workshop has been researched and studied all over the place. And what we're looking at is a study at Smith College that I shared. We did a study at Columbia University Medical Center um, looking at Buried in Treasures as an eviction intervention and showed that um, people that did Buried in Treasures, even though they were on the threshold of eviction, were not losing their housing because they were able to bring it back in to a safe enough level. Wise and Healthy Aging um, out in Santa Monica, California, they're running these groups of folks in their 70s and 80s and 90s and showing remarkable improvements. This whole thing about someone's too old to, no, <laughs> that's BS, that is not true. That is not true. Those kind of low expectations leave people out in the wind without help. It's never too late to start working on this and it is never too early. So CUCS, Center for Urban Community Services, again, um, supportive housing that's in New York City. And right now, we have a study going on at Stanford University actually looking at before and after images of people's brains, taking functional magnetic resonant image, imagery, fMRIs, to see when someone before the group uh, is exposed to something that they're interested in, how does the brain react? And then 16 weeks later, after doing the course, does it look different? Cliffhanger. We don't know yet. We'll see. But about 60 people have already gone through the group. That's a big group of people, really not just committed to getting help, but helping others. Can you imagine how exposed you might feel? You're in a group for something that is so private, and you're going through a battery of tests. I mean, there's a will to help others that's involved there that unless you've been in that position, it's hard to imagine. But imagine that you're going to a group talking about something that you've never told anyone about, but you're stopping at a doctor's office on the way. You're having clutter buddies come into your home from the school to help you. It's extremely invasive, but it's also extremely helpful. 
So it's worth it. And that's why people are sticking with it. So another group that we run, and we're starting to see these groups pop up everywhere. I heard from a group in Portland, Oregon yesterday saying that they had started up their own Finder Keeper workshop. So the idea that people can help each other uh, going out in the community and starting their own groups, leaving uh, Health and Human Services, allowing people to help the next person with the resources they have, fantastic. So this is another model that is sustainable and helpful, and people can do it on their own anywhere. But what about self-care? What about taking care of yourself? So we've been talking about reducing stuff, but what about taking care of yourself emotionally, physically? I've been working on this for 13 years now, 13 years. If I didn't do things to take care of myself, I would have burnt out a long time ago, and so would my wife. We have to do things to keep ourselves going. You know, the idea that you have to be like done with this before you deserve a reward, you know, if you've just worked on things for two minutes, go for that walk. You deserve it, you know? Have that ice cream. Do that thing that's fun. Play that video game. Whatever it is, you deserve it because you're working on it, right? Working on it. As long as you're working on it, that's success right there. You're sticking with it. So the wrap for life uh, includes a, a version. It's Wellness Recovery Action Plan. It's a self-care uh, plan. And Wrap for Reducing Clutter is all about taking care of the clutter while taking care of yourself. So wellness tools that don't add to your stuff. So instead of going out to like Planet Records and buying CDs, stream it online. Uh, instead of going out uh, to an art store and buying more paints, stay at home and use the ones you have. So you start to sort of shift your sense of identity from what you have to what you do, right? And at the same time, you're avoiding adding things. So you're, you're coming to fulfill your, your true identity. Now, today's talk is pursuing a life less cluttered. It's hard to see because of the light, but I'm standing in our basement working on my clutter. All around here are boxes and bags that are open and being processed at the bottom of a box of random stuff. I came to the last page of the Wrap for Reducing Clutter, and this is what it says. This concludes your wrap for clutter. We hope that you feel better prepared for the challenges ahead and that there is some relief in that. Changing habits that took a lifetime to create is no small task and it doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen if you work hard at it. Cheers to a life less cluttered. So really to be able to stand up here and talk to you as someone who has gone through this experience of, of recognizing that I had a problem um, and dealing with it, um, I want to show that recovery is possible. A lot of people don't believe that it is for themselves or for others. So they either give up on themselves or they give up on other people. It can be extremely frustrating, extremely upsetting, um, and extremely damaging, right? Uh, but if we start to reduce the harm that is coming from the clutter a little at a time, Life gets safer, life can get better, and you realize that you gain by letting go. By letting things go, we start to have more free time, right? The weight of that guilt is reduced because I'm thinking, you know, every Friday, what am I doing this weekend? Working on the house. How many of you said that? What are you doing this weekend? Working on the house. How many of you actually worked on the house? <laughs> nah, right? Well, that was the highest score I saw out there was eh. So how does that feel? worse. So Monday comes around, you're back to your work week, and Friday comes around again, going to work on the house. And so it's this real spiral of frustration and upset um, that has been alleviated from working on this. At first, then it was like, you know what, yeah, we can make a plan this weekend. Yeah, we could go out to a diner for breakfast, we can do something like that. I had just been feeling so bad that I didn't think I deserved it or had time. There's time for fun. <clears throat> My experience with this has been global. I had no idea that someday, as recently as a few days ago, we'd be asked to go and <laughs> speak in Tasmania at a conference 
for delivering services to rural and extremely remote areas. Now, what about that buried in treasures workshop model do you think could be helpful to people that are rural and extremely remote? How could that help someone? How could that model be helpful? There's people with lived experience everywhere, right? Give them the tools to help each other. There you go. Recovery starts. Support starts. We're not alone anymore, right? So having tools that are that portable that we can email the facilitator guide to someone halfway around the world and they can start to support each other is a fantastic feeling. I would not have gotten to this point if I didn't have the education and the support and the motivation to work on it. You know, my wife was there at my side when I hadn't told anybody else. Um, eventually I shared with friends and family and colleagues and they were supporting me too. But in that shame, I was isolating. And not only was I isolating myself, I was isolating Becca. And she'll tell you more about that. So for me, there's been a lot to gain by letting things go. The most important things, I think, are my relationship, um, my career, my sense of self, my sense of pride and dignity, um, shedding that guilt, shedding that shame, and looking out at a group like this and starting to see a glimmer of hope on some of your faces saying, maybe I can get better too. Maybe I can do this too. I'm thinking of 12-step uh, recovery programs and mm -hmm. how powerful and successful they are. And the key ingredient is willingness. What about somebody who, um, I personally believe they have this problem, you can't like, you know, make somebody willing. Do you have to be, how do you get somebody who you believe has a problem help without, you know, you don't force it on somebody and. Mm -hmm. So the question essentially is about ambivalence. You've got a, a friend or a family member, somebody that you know, and you recognize that there's too much stuff. Maybe they don't. You really want to help them. How do you do that? How do you maybe tip the balance if somebody is thinking about it or not thinking about it at all? Well, denial, too. Or denial. Yeah. With that situation, I think providing help might push the person even further away. Um, if the consequences of not working on something are devastating, then it's about addressing the situation from a health and safety standpoint. Not saying that you have a problem you have to admit to, but rather we need to work on this. Let's, let's do that, right? So it's not necessarily about accepting some kind of a, a diagnosis or something like that. It's about how clutter is impacting life. What am I missing out on? To be able to say to somebody, I miss coming over to your home. I miss visiting. Um, it would be nice to see you again. You can kind of start to shine a light on how it's impacting other people in their life. And that shared insight can be very, very helpful and totally a mystery. The person that seems like they're in denial might be keenly aware that they have an issue. When I was going to a psychiatrist in the beginning, I wasn't admitting all the things I was experiencing because I didn't want another freaking diagnosis. I didn't want another thing broken about me. I didn't want to have to like admit that I had this other problem, but at the same time, I couldn't get help for what I wasn't sharing. The more trust was developed between myself and her, the more I was willing to come out and share. So it can look like denial. Sometimes it's just privacy, like I don't want to talk about it. So we can never assume that someone does or doesn't recognize a problem, um, but we can see whether or not they're working on it. So recognizing that some of the language we use in our best you know, um, attempt to help people can be triggering. It can be difficult. Um, that's, that's really important to consider. Do I know what's helpful to this person or not? Um, am I doing this because I want the change or because they do? Having that education ready, having the resources available, knowing there's a phone number to call or something like that, that's the kind of tools I want to have on hand when someone comes to me and says, I recognize I have a problem. So I think that as a group we'll address probably ambivalence. A lot of you are probably wondering, how do I get someone to accept help that doesn't want it? Um, a lot of us have experienced that. 
Um, we can revisit it in a bit. So after all of that work to come to where I am, this says, let go. That is on the front of a box, one of three that I'm using to sort. And the middle one says, let go. The one on the right says, not sure. And the one on the left says, keep. So that's our kitty honey bee, rest in peace. She's given me moral support while I make these tough decisions. Becca's across the room taking some action shots <laughs> of me actually letting some of these things go. And I got to tell you, if I couldn't tell that I'm holding a Mad Magazine, I wouldn't be able to tell you any of the things that I let go that day at all. But I could tell you the couple of things I did save. There was a noise maker, little thing that you blow through and it makes a whistle. Totally kept that. Um, there, were, um, there was a special pencil that I hadn't seen in a long time that used to be like my lucky pencil. Maybe if I hadn't lost it in second grade, I would have done a lot better in math. But <laughs> so it goes, so it goes, sort of a clutter tax on life. But it's those things that I saved and made room for so that I could enjoy them that give me pleasure, right? So now I can find the things I like, I can share them with other people, and I don't feel embarrassed about it. I'm not the only person in recovery. I'm not the only person having success. We're going to show you some pictures later um, of other people's work that they're working on that have gone through Buried in Treasures workshops that are continuing to meet and finding and keeping workshops and are not giving up, sticking with it. So with my time, that's what I wanted to share today. The fact that recovery is real, the fact that people do get better, the fact that a community can rally around someone and support them to look at the person, not the problem, to look at what's strong, not just what's wrong, to step up and help. That's what I want to see. And that's what we try to do. So thank you for allowing me to share some of my story. Uh, now, my story isn't complete without Becca's story. So I'm going to yield the microphone um, and let her tell her side of the story. Thanks. Well, I can go ahead and tell you. Lee and I met in 2003. Um, I had not been to his apartment yet where all the stuff, the fascinating stuff was kept. Um, we were talking and all of our beginning conversations were about our love for helping people and humanity and the great things that we wanted to do in connecting with people. So for someone who thought that he needed things, to get friends. This is really stunning and strange almost for me to hear because the stuff never figured into anything when we were getting to know each other. So that was Lee's perception of his identity too. But I didn't see that part. I just saw this amazing human with a great heart. <laughs> I had no idea there was stuff involved. Wow, maybe that'll be a bonus, we'll see. So um, my talk is Room com for Compassion and Space for Hope, because in a lot of these situations where a home is overstuffed, people forget the love that's there and that there are, are a lot of feelings involved and perspectives on both sides that really need to be taken into account. So we're going to talk about that through this light. So 2003 we met, 2004 we got married, and uh, it was very hopeful and exciting, and I saw a great future ahead with brightness and shininess and all the things you might imagine as a new couple. And we were living at that time in his apartment that he did share with other housemates. And it was a full apartment, but a few people lived there, so I didn't really think twice about it. He had his video game collection. It wasn't really anything to me. I'm not really a stuff person. Hmm. I've traveled around the world. Um, I couldn't keep stuff everywhere. I've lived in a lot of different places. So Lee and I are really at far ends of the spectrum with our connection to things. Um, I don't take souvenirs from anywhere I go. It's all stored in here. For better or worse, the memory, keeps it. So um, I said to Lee, 
this is great. We're married, and we've been living together in this shared apartment with a few people for a year. Hooray, we're getting our own space. I'm so excited. What are you going to bring to our new home? And he said, oh, it's all, everything's coming with me here. I said, wait a second. This is a whole apartment, and there's tons of stuff. What do you mean it's all coming? He said, it's all mine. <laughs> Those lucky housemates. I didn't realize they had a fully furnished, even with entertainment apartment. But they did, so that was news to me because I, I wasn't really engaged with this stuff. So that was a surprise. And he said, it's all coming with me. And my reaction was, you have got to be kidding. This can't be happening. And he said, no, 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 it is. And I had great reservations, but what could I do? He said, it's coming. We're married, it's coming. OK. So in my mind, me, who never collects souvenirs from anywhere I go, there's my little idea of a Mini Cooper that I'm going to bring my few boxes of stuff. And here's this guy that I love, who all I think we want to do together is help humanity the rest of our lives. He's got you know, an 18-wheeler. So there's me. Here we go to our new apartment. Yay. <laughs> OK, so here we go. Um, this is what it looks like. Now, I don't know what you think of this picture. Can anyone tell me what? If you see this picture, what, what do you think? Any ideas? It looks familiar. I thought it might look familiar to some people in this room today. Now, to me, this picture looks like people are moving. When I see that, it looks like um, action is happening, and certainly that's not going to stay that way. However, it did stay that way, and it was worse than that. That's my dining room. Let's see. This is my um, dining room. We had a computer squeezed in. Um, the kitchen is just to the right. Um, yeah, not really usable space. Where do you eat? Where do I eat? In your lap. We'll get there, right, in our lap, on the couch, wherever we can squeeze in. So this was the beginning of my fresh new marital apartment. And my kitty, cats are really good about getting around. She had no room to move. She could not even squeeze into a place. That was very disturbing for me because I'm willing to live with a little sacrifice, but when I see my honeybee not able to get around, that's a little different. So it was very disturbing, and of course I did the thing saying to Lee, like, what's going to happen? Like, we can't live like this. Now, this was not the only problem we had going on with this stuff. He had a pod that he was spending $50 a month on. He had an antiques collectibles booth where things were priced too high so they didn't sell. So he was paying for the booth. We actually had a new boss at the time, and um, we stored some of our stuff in her shed. So like, it was out of control. Like, it just didn't make sense, and it didn't feel good either. So I found that I was starting to get really upset and depressed, because I'm only human, and that didn't really feel habitable for me. This is what it looks like. Now, we got another home later, but this process that we've been working on has been since 2005. So we were in that tiny apartment. We were struggling. I did the, Lee, can you move stuff? The nagging, the this, the that. None of it worked. I tried to be nice at first. Then I just started getting really depressed and upset. And you can see that the reason, sometimes people are confused, like, why is it such a big deal for the partner? And what I found in dealing with this, no one ever was interested in my piece of this puzzle. It was always about the person with too much stuff. They're the focus. Well, who do I turn to? I had studied psychology at Smith College with Randy Frost, who is like the world-renowned expert on hoarding disorder. And I never realized what a part of my personal life he would wind up being. And now I work with him to spread the word and the help. But at the time, you know, Lee was doing this work, and he was getting help. But I was getting angry. I was like, wow, Randy Frost doesn't care about me and people like me. Like, no one's talking to me about how I feel or how I'm going to get better. All the focus is on the person with the stuff. Now, the reason I was so troubled is because, let's say I wanted to get to my art supplies. When Lee and I got together, I was quite a vibrant, fun, 
person with lots of hobbies and interests, but you look, okay, I, I see his, the salon chair that we had four of so he could make projects all over our house. My art supplies are hidden. I cannot access the things that are important to me. The person who has this stuff really has all the control in the environment. And it, it goes beyond the physical control. There's that emotional control that goes right along with it that gets forgotten when we talk about this. Yes? Do you ever try to rearrange or discard anything? I will talk a little bit more about my process here, but I will tell you absolutely no, I never try to discard anything because uh, that would make things much worse, and I, I had a feeling about that. So this is another example of what's frustrating for the people who live in the home. Um, I needed to get my keys. Now this was later in our recovery process where Lee said, hey, I'm rearranging stuff. Do you mind if I put this over here for now? It's going to be gone in a few hours. And I said, that's great. But you know what? Guess what? I went to leave the house. My keys are in that drawer. So even his temporary trying to deal with the issue impeded me from leaving my house. Made me late, made me frustrated. When I go to clean the house, if I was vacuuming, I'm bumping into stuff, it got to the point where I was just ramming that vacuum cleaner with anger around my place to get to whatever I could. So lots of anger and resentment were welling up in me. And more bins, bins and bins of stuff just bins everywhere. And the fact that it's contained in a bin doesn't really make it feel better to the people living in the home. It's nice that it's kind of organized, but it's not, what kind of aesthetic was that for me? That's not the home I wanted. And again, here you see, I can't put my coat in the closet. So it's all these little things that add up. So it's not just the taking over the whole space. It's all the little things that people don't think about that make things difficult, too. So what on earth was I supposed to do? I was at a loss. I felt all alone in this. Um, I didn't have anyone to turn to. Um, friends, I, we weren't really having friends come over because, like you said, where do you, where do you eat? Where do you sit? Um, I had to figure it out because I was so isolated and so frustrated and I could not access all the things that made me feel good about myself. But I wanted to stay because I love this man quite a bit. So I had to think about the love tester. Is this worth staying? Do I want this? How much do I love this person? And I decided unequivocally, yes, I want to stay. Let's work on this. So there was nothing to it but to do it. And for me, um, one of the things that I realized is I needed to have someone to talk to outside the home about all the negative things I was feeling. Because I didn't want to berate Lee. I love this man. I want him to get better. I want our life to get better. So I realized that I had to do what, what I call stop the, to the, the cascade of toxicity, which means that negative talk, the feedback, the when are you going to do this? When isn't, you know, it, it does not help. All those negative things that I could come back into the home and put on Lee were not going to help us at all. It's just going to exacerbate all the difficult emotional processing that we needed to do. So I needed to have a safe space while Lee was working on it because he was. As, as you heard, he started a study in 2005, so I was seeing him work on it. And he was running three buried and treasures groups a week. So I knew he was totally dedicated to this process. And even though my house still looked like those pictures you saw, things were changing slowly, but they were. And I held on to that. And that was really the most important thing for me to remember every day. This person is working on it. Now how can we prioritize and work things out in a way that makes it easier for both of us as we go along? So I, I did, I got myself a therapist. Friends are great to talk to, but sometimes they can stir the pot. Sometimes they can be like, mm, are you sure you wanna stick around for that? Yes, I do. I'm not gonna talk to you about this problem anymore. You know, you have to find the right people to talk to. 
And so what I did was I did find it very important to have an outlet where I could say all the ugly, horrible things I felt about Lee, about the house, about how upset I was. I needed a place for that. I go, I dump it there. I come home, I take a deep breath. And what are we working on today? How are we doing? What are we going to put for fun into our life? So there really had to be an outlet. I couldn't just pretend it was fine. It wasn't. I had a lot of resentment built up. Now my favorite band has a line in a song that says, love is a marathon. And sometimes you puke. <laughs> we have been doing this for a long time. Lee and I have been together 15 years. Sometimes you got to go past those hard moments and know, yeah, it's going to be okay. And we're going to get past those ugly moments, but it's not all going to be pretty. You're in it to win it. And I kept in mind, I had to keep this vision in my head, like, what are we working towards? And you see, I have this one little vase of flowers. The house could be thoroughly crowded, but I had to find spaces and carve out places where I could see my vision of hope within the house, even while we were in the bleakest moments. So just carving out a little space like that is really important. And again, if you take one thing away for people who are living with this problem, I really think it's that stop the, the bad talk and all the negativity just feeding, because it just, just blows up right inside the house. It's not doing any good. But we all do need a place to get that out, too. So I think it's really important to remember compassion if you're a partner or a family member in this situation here. Now we talk about the percentage of people that um, have the issue with too much clutter, but you know what number we don't talk about? All the other people who are affected. All the people who live in the homes with them. All the pets, all the relatives, all the people who care, the grandchildren who can't come over. Like, if we know this percentage of people over collects, the number of people impacted by that is far, far greater. And so I think it's really important. Because during this process, I really felt so insignificant as a family member. There really wasn't anyone addressing my needs. When we go about looking at this to help people in the family that, that are suffering with this, I think to aid that compassion piece, we need to think about what's really in those boxes. I don't know if any of you have clutter, but um, even for myself, someone without a collecting issue, I still develop clutter. Um, I had a stack after my parents passed of things I didn't want to deal with. And I realized it's not so different from the collections other people have. I opened up the box, I got the courage, and there, my parents' marriage license, you know, birth certificates, photos, bills from, you know, the funeral that I didn't want to file at the time. And I just am telling you that to show you that in all those boxes you see, it's not garbage, it's not trash. Like, at a glance, people call it that. But it's not. There's a lot of important things in there, and they matter to people for a multitude of reasons. So as we were going along, I had to come up with some tricks. Now, the very first thing that made a big difference in our life, it came, it's along the lines of setting limits. Um, we weren't having friends over because there was no space, and it was embarrassing. And I wasn't telling people we have too much stuff. I didn't even really know how to talk about it. Despite studying psychology at Smith and having Randy Frost as a professor, I really didn't know how to integrate like, what I learned in class into my life. So it took some time to work through that. But setting limits was super important. So I was sick of not having people over. And you might imagine that was um, really disheartening to have a, a multitude of friends that couldn't come to your house anymore, suddenly for no good reason. So Lee was at work, and I decided, you know what? He's never told me not to have people over, but it feels like we shouldn't. But I want my friends to come over. And so Lee was at work, and I said, hey, four people that I love, how about you come over and have some tea with me? You know what? They showed up. And they walked in, and they were like, where should we sit? And I said, sit on top stuff. And they did not mind. And I had four people there. We were enjoying ourselves. We pushed this stuff aside. Yep, 
All those pictures you see of clutter, stacks, that's what my house looked like. But we squeezed four people in and we had a blast and I loved being with my friends. And then Lee walked in from work and he looked like, oh. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, well, this might be a good conversation later tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he joined the little party I was having. And you know what? The friends we had, no one seemed to care. No one said, why are you being so weird in your house? Like, none of that figured in. So after that, they left, and Lee and I did talk. And he was not angry, but he did, I think, realize the magnitude of how this was impacting me. And I think that was really the first step in us getting better in that respect, because he didn't really, I don't feel like he got what I was missing out on. And like he mentioned earlier, perspectives are different. We never really quite know what people know and understand and don't. But I didn't feel like he got it until that night. So I felt like, ooh, so powerful and so strong having those people come over finally. And that was life changing, because from that moment, we didn't go back. Like, it was forward. I like, claimed my space. I said, this is my house too, and I need to live here in a way that makes me happy. Another thing I did was um, set up the Lee Zone. Now the Lee Zone in our house, fortunately um, by this time we had a bigger house where we had space to actually hold the Lee Zone. The Lee Zone was a place in the home where you can squeeze everything you can fit into your room, your office, as long as that door shuts. I don't care what's in it, I'm not gonna go in it, I'm not gonna touch it. And so that is what we arranged. And sometimes stuff would eke out of the door and I might shove it back under there. Or I'd say, this is, where does this go? Does this go out or does it go into the Lee zone? And so that was a really helpful strategy for us and, and he understood it. And none of our strategies worked perfectly or every day, but they worked enough to change our life. Now another thing I learned was, um, if anyone knows, clutter is definitely a magnet for clutter, but do you know what else is a magnet for clutter? free space. So, so when, we made, when we managed to make free space in the home, I'd write a little note, I'd draw my stick figures on, and I'd say, clutter-free zone, sticky note goes down. You gotta set something there. I don't know why, but that little black and white note helps. Like, oh no, she can't put her keys down there, it's this clutter-free zone. I also put up signs and, um, my in-laws are here, they can attest. They've seen the strangeness of the signs. I posted all around my kitchen saying, I like clean cupboards and I cannot lie. Like all these <laughs> tricks, all these tricks. So yeah, I look a little freaky when you walk in my house and you see notes, but guess what? I got clear space and the only thing on it is a sticky note. That makes me feel good. And that's what's important. This is another vision. You know, I like flowers. Um, there have been some points in our life where I didn't have room to put the vases up all over like I want to in my dream home in a new married house. But um, just keeping the little things and remembering sometimes in a person's home there's not space for a vase. But you know what? You can put a flower on a windowsill. I just feel like it's really important to find the small ways to remember the goodness and what you're working towards. Now I'm going to tell you a funny story. This will be in the book if there ever is one written one day, but you're getting, you're getting the sneak preview. Now Lee and I have been working on this since 2005. He's been steadily working. I have no complaints. It was never as fast as I wanted though. Never. Because I wanted the clutter gone years ago and it just does not work that way. So. In 2012, Lee had been working great on his recovery for years now and leading groups and speaking out, and it was fantastic. And he said, um, a company from South Korea, the media company from Seoul, wants to come to our house and talk to us about recovery. I wasn't exactly sold on that at that point because he, I felt like, was a little further along in his recovery and his um, comfort and trust in that process than I was. I was still like, ah, oh, we're getting better, but I still don't feel absolutely fantastic yet about this. 
But okay, let's Seoul come. So South Korea came, and I got home from work, and they were due to arrive in a couple of hours. And now my office is a, it's a vac zone. There's no Lee stuff in my office. But I walked into my office that day before the camera crew was about to get there, and oh my gosh, my office was full of stuff. And it wasn't mine. Huh. How'd that happen? I was at work all day, and then I came home. Mm. Okay, so the camera crew's coming soon, and I said, I'm going to take a little walk over to Lee's office, the Lee Zone, see what's going on in there today when the interview is going to happen. Well, I open the door. The angels started singing. <laughs> it looked gorgeous in there. Oh, my goodness. Meanwhile, my office door is closed, piled to the gills, and I freaked out. They were on their way, so and good. I was freaking out. So I said, what is going on here? So I took all the boxes from my office. He said, well, you know, I wasn't quite done. I said, oh, no, honesty. you got to tell them exactly where you're at, because we weren't perfect. It wasn't perfect. It was great progress, but we weren't perfect. So I was moving those boxes out of my office, into the hallway, kicking stuff. I didn't care. I was screaming. I was cursing. I was not happy. And people were coming with cameras really soon from a different country. <laughs> and he said, but, but your office wasn't going to be in it anyway. It was just going to be closed. I said, oh, no. No, no, that's not the point here. <laughs> so. They came, and it was another great moment in progress for us because Lee talked to them about where, the truth of where we were at. And I want to mention, recovery, it's not a straight line. I don't think in anything you're trying to get better from. It's not. You know, it's like the tango or the cha-cha. You move a few steps forward, you go a little back, and it's okay. And that's the takeaway message I want people, family members and people struggling themselves, it's okay if you do a little forward and a little back. It's natural. Life is complicated. It's going to happen. But the main thing that kept us going was I knew we were always on this forward-moving trajectory, even when there were slips. And he totally apologized about Korea. And the funny thing was, they later, they didn't know really what was going on. So they could kind of tell we weren't happy with each other. And then they asked me to make dinner for him on camera. <laughs> oh, and so they, Mamie, who was our interviewer, she could tell we weren't pleased, and she kept saying to us, show us loving moments. <laughs> Can we see some loving moments? So I give a peck and say, there's your loving moment. So we got through it, and now it's a funny story I can tell. Mm-hmm. But uh, here's a happy sight. There was no room for my cats to play. And we've reached a point where not only there's room to have friends over and for me to put up some flowers, but Kaya can rest on the living room floor. And uh, it feels really good. And this is really important. I was due, Lee wanted me to speak with him. He was speaking in San Francisco in 2014. And I was excited that I would get to be a part of this because keep in mind, I'd been complaining that no one wanted to hear from me and I was so insignificant all these years. Um, another thing I will mention at this moment is when newspapers got the story to spread our stories of recovery, no one ever turned to me. Not one reporter ever turned to me and said, how do you feel? What's going on with you? How are you living through this? Never, never. We had lots of media, and we still do. People are just now starting to turn to me and go, do you have anything to say to the other people that are impacted in the home? But no one ever did. And so my resentment, it didn't fade easily. It didn't, because every time a reporter called, it was like, yay, I'm glad this is getting out. But again, we're lost. Like, where, where are all the people who live with this? So I was due to speak in 2014 in San Francisco, and I said to Lee, you know what? I got to back out. Well, it was booked. I was supposed to be there. I said, I am still too resentful and too angry to stand up in front of a room full of people 
and talk about how great we're doing. Like, we are doing great, and I love you more than anything, but I still feel so angry that there's just no way I can get up there and purport to be this happy, you know, fun-loving person, because I didn't feel it at the time. So I didn't go, and Lee spoke on his own. And then later in 2014, we went to Australia to talk. Actually, it was Lee's speaking engagement there. Um, did Randy go with us that time? No, it's just, just Lee. So I was, the, I was the, along for the company, and he had a great keynote speech. It was fantastic, well, well attended. And at the end, a woman in the audience named Judy said, I would like to hear from your wife. Holy moly. Are you serious? Someone wants to hear from me? Someone cares about the other side of what's going on in the house? I had never, never felt like that would be a part of what we do. So Judy doesn't, she knows now because we told her she changed my life. Once I felt like someone wanted to hear this side, I felt so not alone. Like, yeah, other people do need to hear what I say. It is important to give guidance to the others. So I have learned to speak up, even if a little rusty. I gain a lot of confidence, and every time we go out to speak, there's usually people waiting to talk to Lee, but then there's a lot of people waiting because they relate to my side of this story, too. And I want those people not to be forgotten and to know they're just as important in someone getting better. You know, It really takes the support. You can't really do it in isolation. So now I go out with my megaphone. I haven't met a microphone that I don't like since 2015. And um, I'm just here to spread the word and show it can be done. But there needs to be a lot of self-care for the person who is living and hopefully being patient and assisting their loved one and working on this. It really takes two. Um, identity is a big part of what gets thwarted when someone's living in a crowded house. Now, Lee was talking about collecting stuff as a means of his identity, which is so ironic because I had to tell you, I met this guy, I still don't give a hoot about all his stuff. I still don't. I still want to be on that deserted island. I don't need a thing. Let's just talk. So for me, that was part of his identity, and my identity was about accessing the things I needed, like the clothes I needed for work. I was impacted by his collections because when he was acquiring, and he was acquiring a lot, things were coming in all the time. Not even things that cost money, but there's plenty of things on the curb. If you don't think free things add up and cause problems, they do. So even things as simple as getting dressed for work, if I had set an outfit out, that could get ruined because then stuff is getting put on it, and then suddenly I've got dust all over what I wanted. Or I actually have boxes to like move out of the way to get to the smallest things I need. So there's a lot of ways that that impacts people on both sides. Now, I would like to show you something that really has helped guide me. I'm a big fan of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, the author of The Little Prince. And I found this quote that I really think reflects what people need as they go about their vision and working together. Life has taught us that love does not consist in gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction. That to me is what Lee and I needed to decide whether we wanted to do that. And yes, the papers have said she gave him an ultimatum. It's me or the stuff. Now that sounds mean, right? I've always learned it. No one gives, you don't give an ultimatum. The ultimatum really was, I need to be happy and healthy and I can't do it in this house. I don't want to leave you, but this is not going to work. So yes, there was an ultimatum issue. The ultimatum was, I can't be well living here. So are we going to stay together and allow me to be a happy, healthy person? Or are you going to have to do it alone with your stuff? And because we had this shared vision, like he agreed. He wanted this with me. He was at the point of readiness. And I think when we talk about ambivalence and how people get to that point of readiness, you need to think about what is the motivation for people. And for us, you know, it was wanting to continue this relationship and grow together in life. And that was what we shared. But for other people, things that motivate them to change 
might be things like having their grandkids over, being able to have a cup of tea with a person, you know, having a friend over after a, a service on a Sunday. There's so many different ways to reach people, but it needs, they need to feel that drive themselves. We can't, we can't make our agenda and put it on them. They're not gonna, people aren't gonna do it. They have to feel those reasons for themselves. But what we can do, I think, is kind of shine a light on some of those reasons that people might want to make change. And I think that's what we can all do as we come together and move forward. So that, oh, I do have another picture. My tomatoes. Now, I've had a couple of kitchens together that we've shared where you couldn't have room for anything on the counter. I love to cook, but you saw in that first house I showed you where the dining room was cluttered, there was no space for stuff going on in the kitchen. So here in our new kitchen, oh my gosh, I have a space I can just fill it with tomatoes while I'm working on them after the farm visit. It's fantastic. And with that, I will say thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to your questions.